beautiful cup. A beautiful oh, cup. Hey. I, always, I use this cup every day, every time. Don't I, Steph? Every, yeah. every meeting, I use this cup. Andrea had one that looks similar. Yeah, she gave it to me. Oh, really? Well, this, this one that I just got from, you know, who gave me this was Marcy Robinson. Oh, that's nice. Beautiful. I love it. All right, let's go, Joe. Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. I was talking to Andrea, who's our guest tonight. Hi, Andrea. Hello. She's a homie of path from... And my best friend. Angela. my best friend. Very best friend. <laughs> from beautiful British Columbia. So tonight we're doing a East Coast meets West Coast. Julie, as you know, is in Nova Scotia and we've got what I think is gonna be double trouble with us this evening. <laughs> taking questions about homeopathy. All right, so um, as everyone knows, if you wouldn't mind, keep the Q&A in the Q&A area for me. I'll moderate questions. Andrea, Susan says, hi. Hi. And the session will last an hour. I'm, I'm hoping that, Andrea, you could start by kind of telling us how maybe you and Julie connected or what got you interested in, in homeopathy and sent you on this journey. Yeah. Andrea is my girl too, Suzanne says. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, I, I started on this journey um, in 1998-99, my, my very old dog got sick. He was 16 years old and he got really sick and the vet said there was nothing that could be done for him and I didn't want to give up. And I walked into the store and uh, asked the woman in the store if there's anything I could feed him because he wasn't eating anything. And she said, why don't you try raw? And I didn't know what raw was then, so I had to get her to explain that to me. And there was one company that made raw food then. Um, the only, only one prepared raw food. So we know how, how that's changed in the last 20 years. And um, I, I phoned the woman who was the uh, owner of the company and she connected me with, with Julianne Lee and she said, just call Julianne Lee and bring your dog to see her. Julie was working with this woman. Um, her name was Natasha Benton Corleon, and her she was the first raw food produced the first raw food thanks to Julie. It was a cook diet, and Julie said it should be raw. So that's how I got connected with Julie. I brought my dog in to see her. Uh, we she treated him uh, holistically, homeopathically, naturopathically, and he recovered like you would not believe. A 16-year-old dog in liver and kidney failure, dementia, blind, deaf, arthritic, it's falling over, wouldn't eat anything. And my vet just said, well, there's nothing more you can do, with, do for him. He's a very old dog. But there was a lot more we could do for him. So Toby lived to be 18 years old. I was just so blown away by homeopathy and Julie and everything that, that she did for my dog, that I literally decided that I, I didn't want to do what I was doing anymore. I had a career in radio news broadcasting. I did a series on raw food and homeopathy and over-vaccination for animals. I interviewed Julie. I interviewed a whole bunch of holistic vets and did a whole bunch of research on vaccines and, and everything. And um, the series ran on, on News 1130 which is where I worked here in Vancouver. And after that, I just, I just felt like I needed to take my life in a different direction. So I, I remember asking Julie on the phone one day, do you ever hire people that don't have any experience in, in veterinary medicine? And she said, maybe. <laughs> and the rest is history. I, um, I I worked two days a week with Julie at the clinic in the evenings. I still have my full-time job in radio. And I think it took me, this will be a couple of years before I finally left radio. And then I, I just enrolled in homeopathic school, became a human homeopath. And then I took Julie's course to become a, an animal homeopath. And it was just, we, we worked together. I worked alongside Julie for, for the whole time here in Vancouver. Before like she 13, 13 years, didn't we work together for like 13 years? 
Yeah, well, it Maine started was in a long, long time. Really, 1989 really until when did you move? 2000, 2014. Wow, yeah. So 15 years. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. And I know, and she's being really modest about her, her radio thing because Andrea had a really amazing career actually as a, as a, um, not just a broad, what did you, what, what are, you were like I was a, a, a news anchor, news anchor. But you yeah. also have your, you went to school to do um, journalism, right? So when she did this, this series and they actually aired it on like one of the biggest uh, news stations or, or broadcasting stations in Vancouver, she did an incredible job because when she came to see me, she did, she knew nothing about raw food. She didn't know about over vaccinations. She didn't really know about anything. So she delve in, delve, delved into it as a journalist. So when she, she approached the news, the radio station about doing the series, it was, it was incredible. Didn't you get like it was really well received, wasn't it? Like it was. It was very. It was very well received. It was also very controversial. Oh my God! Massively. Time, back nobody. Nobody even knew what raw food was at the time. So we got into the whole raw food diet and the carnivore and over vaccination. Which, I mean, today there's so much information about it online, but there was there was nothing. No, I know. No, there was. There, it was really like like. You know, people were really blown away by it, especially being on a regular news station. That everybody uh, yeah, mainstream, mainstream yeah. news station. I remember, because people always ask me, you know, when it comes to holistic medicine for, for animals, um, people are often very reluctant to deviate away from what they've known for such a long time. And I don't always share that, that background that I have, but but if you really do investigate, um, it, it's very, very hard to, to, to go back. Because once you become aware of the information, it changes your life and it changes your animal's life. And it changes how you, you look at the world. And it changes how you view health and how the immune system works and, and what we're doing. One of the things that you always say, Julie, is that the the veterinarians and I don't want this to be critical of veterinarians they're just doing what they know and what they've learned but they're the only healthcare profession that advocates for more processed food for their patients there's not a there's not a, a healthcare practitioner on the planet that does that except for veterinarians so yeah you have to yeah they're be, becoming progressive exactly so you should be questioning and you should be looking at what makes logical sense because that's, that's what struck me when I first brought my dog to see you. Why had it never dawned on me that they're carnivores and they should be eating what a carnivore eats? They're, they're not the same physiology that we are. They're very similar, but their digestive system works very differently. So everything from their mouth to their bum is designed to process raw meat. And yet we feed them, well, we know we feed them from a pro processed food from a bag. We wouldn't feed ourselves that way. We wouldn't feed our children that way. Why do we feed our animals that way? Yeah. No, I know. It's, it's, it's starting to change, thank goodness. I remember when I first started in like 97, well, actually 96, mm. uh, people thought I flew in on a broom. Like they, they really like talking about raw food and talking about not vaccinating and treating your animals holistically. And it was just like, wow, what, did, what is she even talking about? But at least we're, we're gaining ground, but we just all have to stick together because the more ground we gain, the harder the pushback is gonna be because of public demand, right? Public inquiry and public people, now with the internet, people can get more and more and more information and educate themselves, right? Yes. So. So anyways, yeah, so that started us off in our, in our, in our friendship slash career together slash, um, you went to, you were with every single vet clinic I had. So I had adored yep. beast at the small little tiny, my first clinic. Then I had, 
um, Vancouver Animal Wellness Hospital, which was our massive undertaking, 7,000 square foot full practice with scopes and physiotherapy and chiropractor and acupuncturist, homeopathy, surgery, yeah. board certified ultrasounds, like the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And then we moved again to another practice and then I opened up the school at UBC and then we moved and we opened another practice and then we opened another practice. <laughs> yeah. And then I left. <laughs> but, and then Andrea took over. So um, yeah, so it's uh, bittersweet, but, but amazing how everything's moving into how it's moving in. So Stephanie, do you want to um, start asking Andrea some questions? Because I know there's going to be a ton. I would love to. Okay. Robin's got a question here about her 13 year old raw fed cat who has intermittent soft smelly poop maybe once a week for the last five months. She does use healthy gut and gut soothe and she's been using some organic whole psyllium husk and or sacar bulardari. Cyclobari, yep. Yeah. He's yeah. happy, energetic, and all else is normal. What should I use or do here? Thanks, Robin. Did you say intermittent soft stool? Yeah, about once a week for the last five months. Hmm. Um, well, it sounds like you're doing all the right things. Mm -hmm. does, the diet, does the diet have any fiber in it whatsoever? And does it have enough bone in the diet? Robin, I see you in the chat over there. Could you, no bone. Is that raw? Raw fed, yes. So that can, that can sometimes be one of the first things you look at if, if stools are not formed enough or hard enough, is do they have an adequate calcium, phosphorus, mineral source, meaning either ground bone or eggshell calcium, yes. Oh, eggshell calcium. So you have to make sure the ratios are correct. And if they are and the stools are still soft, then um, yeah, you can add some things like, like the, the feline gut soothe is amazing. Did, did she say she was on feline gut soothe? I believe she said she's using our regular formulation. Okay. What, gut, like canine gut soothe? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Should I change, yes. To the feline. It's, it's different. Yeah. It is different. And also like, um, you know, look and see if I would look and see too, if there's different proteins. So if she's, if she's rotating proteins, um, can the aloe make soft poop? Yes, the aloe can make soft poop. So um, if he's on different proteins, sometimes, sometimes like the, the protein two days prior to the soft poop can be a culprit too. So if you're going like, I'm just going to chicken, beef, lamb, pork, and you notice that, you know, every Wednesday or like try to turkey, chicken and what? Duck? Did I say duck? Um, yeah. Look and see. I mean, maybe the duck's too fatty and then, you know, and then it, it, it gets off, it gets off stool, but then you, you switch to the next, next one all in one day. Okay, all in one day. Well then, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I look at stress too, right, Andrea? Like, is there certain things that you know, is it, do you work every day the same hours? Is, is, it, is it after a stressful day or after a day that you've left it alone for a, for a long period of time? Um, look at any kind of patterning from a, from a, from a stress level. Um, and he's living the life. <laughs> um, I'm sure he is. Well, then I would change, I would change to gut soothe and the feline gut soothe. And, um, if it continues, I mean, I know Andrea is almost like book solid and not really taking new clients, um, and healthy gut too. So I have one fast question. Did he have soft stool before starting healthy gut and gut soothe? Yes. Okay. So once more often or just once a week? 
That's why I bought it. Is it is it is the soft stools better? Le less often. Okay. Mm -hmm. Less often now or less often before you got it? Nowhere now. Less, less often less now. Often now. Okay, so that's, that's what I would do. I would, I would, um, I would go on the feline gut soothe and maybe decrease his healthy gut a little bit. So instead of giving him the full dose of healthy gut, I would go down to um, half a dose of gut, healthy gut and change to feline gut soothe because for animals that have a half decent or a, a sensitive a sensitive digestive system sometimes even breaking down the food and causing and, and making the food digest even faster can still leave a little bit of a residual effect so i would cut the healthy gut down and switch to feeling gut soup okay let's get some homeopathic should i give psyllium not yet because if you're if you do if you cut that down and everything's honky dory then you don't need psyllium and if you give psyllium now and you cut it down and it helps, we're not going to know what is what. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That was very helpful. Thank you. Homeopathic questions, please. Yep. Roanne's got a question here. When using homeopathy in an acute situation, are the rules about not giving 10 to 20 minutes before or after food or water very important? Will it still work well? Yeah you the, that rule really when you're dealing with an acute situation and you're either needing to give remedies more often like hourly or every two hours it, as long as you wait like five maybe maximum 10 minutes after they get the remedy just as long as it dissolves in the mouth then that's that's plenty of time <coughs> um so so yeah generally they say 15 to 20 minutes no food or water because we want it to dissolve in the mouth but it depends on what you're giving as well. If you're giving a liquid, a liquid remedy, it dissolves almost immediately. So you just have to wait a few minutes. If you are giving um, pellets, they should either be crushed into powder, if they're the big pellets that you would buy in a store, and then that actually dissolves pretty quick. And you can get the little granules that I use are called number 10 pellets, which are tiny, tiny, like um, poppy seed size, and they dissolve really super fast too. So I usually say, if, you know, if it's been five minutes, it's, it'll have to solve by then. Perfect. Thank you. That's for you, Roanne. Heather has a question. Um, this question has stumped her homeopathic vet. Her vet had given her homeopathic sulfur as my cat's constitutional remedy. And soon after she developed symmetric circular lesions of hair loss on her hawks. These lesions seem tender and the skin very thickened. Any thoughts on why this would occur? Could it possibly be from detoxing the vaccines she was given many years ago that were given in her hips? Thank you. Homeopathic sulfur. What, what potency of sulfur was it? Heather, if you're here in the chat, would you mind uh, letting us know the potency you're using, please? 30C. Sulfur, yeah, I mean, sulfur is a, a really good skin remedy. It's probably one of the biggest itchy skin remedies we have. Yeah. It can be a clearing remedy. So when you have a case and you need to, especially with a skin case, sulfur can kind of um, clear toxicity. Also, it's a, it's a good anti-vaccinosin as well. But um, sometimes when you have a... Um, deeper issues going on and the remedy kind of touches those deeper issues then you can get a more external manifestation like a skin thing erupting so that's the one possibility after giving a remedy and they've had what appears to be an aggravation could be an aggravation which means it should clear with a little bit of time and when they have an aggravation like that you don't want to keep giving the remedy because then you can keep making it worse so homeopathic aggravation is what it could be. It could be uh, having touched something on a deeper level and we're seeing a more external manifestation on the skin, which is something that actually happens quite a bit. And what often happens in conventional medicine is 
you end up giving a drug or something to suppress that skin condition, which is a lot, really the last thing you want to do because you want the body to be able to express that and try to deal with it and clear it naturally. So if, if that's what's happening, it can be a direction in the right way because it's more external as opposed to being a deeper internal thing. So yeah, it, it depends on sort of how many doses was given, if it was an aggravation, if it was some kind of a clearing that happened, um, how long the, the animal was on the remedy, et cetera. If they were better overall in themselves and yet they had the skin thing, that's a good, that's a good reaction. Yeah, that's important. That's what I was gonna say. Depends on what he, my dog's barking. Depends on, on like if they're, if they're treating for a certain thing and which is more life-threatening than a skin disease. The skin disease comes out, but everything else is better. Or like you said, overall, emotionally and stuff, they're better, they're more energetic, then that's a really good sign. Perfect, thank you, ladies. Amanda's got a question. There's a couple that revolve around this. Are there any remedies that can give dogs with seasonal allergies some relief? Yes, but this is one of the toughest, I'd say it's one of the toughest things we have to treat. Yeah. Skin, skin issues where it's itchy, itchy, biting, gnawing at themselves, licking their paws, uh, pulling fur out, and seasonal allergies where they're just reacting to everything. What you're trying to do is kind of tone down the immune response to all of those things. And there absolutely are remedies that can help. Sometimes it's difficult to use just a single remedy. You kind of, where I like to use, you know, I, from, from what Julie taught me way back when, is that we use the remedies that, that kind of fit the picture of that individual patient. Um, sometimes you have to use low potency, sometimes higher potencies, depending on how it's all manifesting and how bad they are. But yeah, there are lots of really good remedies for seasonal allergies, um, apis, histaminum, um, sulfur can be really helpful. Um, sometimes doing uh, anti-vaccinosin remedies, so it depends on the whole case, right? Silica and thuya might really help because if it's a, a vaccine-induced thing, then you need to get rid of the toxicity from that vaccine and try to reset the immune system. So yes, homeopathic remedies that can be used for that and also um, supplements to try to um, get the immune system to calm down, reduce inflammation. Yeah, I think I think from a homeopathic, what's what's so incredible about homeopathy, and I mean, Andrea has been part of this journey with me from the get go, mm -hmm. is that that homeopathy helps to shift the vital force. Um, to become less reactive, which is, which is the whole, which is often the causation of that is vaccines, um, especially with animals. But what else, what else vaccines cause is the, you know, imbalance of the microbiome and, you know, then almost like a, like a, they can have almost like a, um, a, a mental emotional effect from, from being so itchy all the time. Like it, skin issues are a really, really, really difficult thing to do. But what's really cool is that, that homeopathy, I think plays, I mean, Andre, you know, this you're doing it all the time, but it plays such a integral part of what my clinic and Andre and I working together, our, our focus was like above all do no harm and to create the best life possible so we didn't really like, there's a lot of homeopaths out there that feel like you give a remedy and you watch and you wait and, you know, the animal's still really itchy or their ears get worse or whatever. I don't subscribe to that because I feel like what happens is they're in that situation, their cortisol levels go up and that stress in itself of them being so uncomfortable winds up creating further further disease and further problems and interferes with the healing process. So, you know, what Andre and I used to do a lot was to choose remedies that yes, fit 
fit the fit the animal's constitution, but also um, remedies that helped in almost acute, eh, Andrea? So uh, like, treating them constitutionally, but then giving them giving them supportive homeopathic remedies to deal with the immediacy of being hot and sticky and itchy and burning and and depressed and freaked out and like there's there's you can kind of layer it right so andrea and i prescribe almost identical um and that's the way that that we do it is 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 looking and then what winds up happening is that you can start to as the as the microbiome gets better and you're you're tweaking the food you're able and you're giving a, a, a constitutional homeopathic remedy you can start to you know slowly decrease the combination remedies or the acute acute remedies that you're giving to alleviate suffering really right and it's it's this really fine balancing act eh, andrea where we're where we're focusing on okay what's this dog dog cat horse doesn't matter constitutional remedy what's 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 deep down what's at the what's at the essence of it mm -hmm. but then how do we what do we add to that along like remedy wise along with you know probiotics and food, like i said food tweaking supplements whatever and and allow the body to regain its balance faster and with less suffering because when there's suffering the balance doesn't happen very fast because of the 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 the, the rise in cortisol and stress and they it they itch and then they cause secondary bacteria infections just from itching right like in opening their skin and biting and so it's a really cool way like like anyone out there that has a really bad case of allergies or skin disease, I can, I really, really think that if you can work with a homeopath that has that philosophy, like skin, especially when you say Andrea, because mm -hmm. it's such a tough, it's such a tough one to deal with that you really need a lot of support. Yeah. It's a tough one to deal with. And it's, it's one that takes a long time. Yeah. So, you know, you might, you might not see, you might see some alleviation initially and then setbacks, but every season it usually will kick up again. So it's a matter of figuring out what is it that is triggering them, um, what's working for them and what isn't, what component of it is diet, what component of it is um, environmental and seasonal. And with each year, gradually it should it should get better. I have my dog Easton has seasonal allergies and every year he starts to do it. I have him on remedies. I have him on your supplements. I have him on all the stuff. Um, and I would say it's probably been about five years going. It's since we moved out to more of a rural area that it started with him. Five years now, this is your, you're the first year I've seen where the duration of it has been less. But he's also not I mean, he loses his fur, he gets, you know, um, hair loss and itchy and gets all these crusty things around his, his lips and everything as well. He's uncomfortable, but he's not off the charts uncomfortable where I think I, you know, I have to intervene with something conventional. And that's also the balance as well of, sometimes you do have to use conventional medicine in conjunction with what you're doing holistically and homeopathically, but you have to know when to use it, how long to use it, and to try not to still have going in the right direction overall with that animal. Yeah. And, and how other, to detox yeah. they are on drugs. The other cool thing is working with a vet. Like homeopathy is something that's in in my experience and our experience where if an animal is on a drug that you can wind up putting them on almost like a micro dose of the drug. So let's let's use prednisone as an example. Um, there's a lot of a lot of dogs on prednisone, or a lot of even cats on prednisone um, for skin disease, and and we can usually get them to a place where if they have to stay on it long term, like if they've had so much suppressant suppression, or there's something 
you know, massively going on, even with hormonally, because we, we, you know, they don't have their sex hormone hormones and we, and, it, and there's a, you know, a lot of times I believe that, that dogs and cats don't have enough cortisol. So, um, or they have too much, um, where you, when you're giving, it's almost like they come in, they're on the drugs and then, you know, we go through the case and whatever, we put them on everything. They start to get better. We start to reduce the drugs like this. And then what can happen is that you get to a plateau where, oh, the symptoms start showing again. So you leave the drug there and then they start to get better. You incorporate another remedy or whatever, and then you reduce the drug even more. And we've had, you know, conversations with veterinarians and with pharmacists saying, well, that's impossible. They're on such a small amount of, of prednisone. You might, like, there's, there's no, there's no um, therapeutic value in giving this animal this much of that drug. You know, we've even seen it with, with thyroid medication, right? So, and there is because I, I, I truly believe that they're lacking in so many hormones and so many things that sometimes they just need sort of that homeostasis or that balance with the supplements of food and the remedies. And then just the most minuscule amount of a drug that is not clinically therapeutic, but winds up just making that difference, right? And then it doesn't have the side effects. Mm -hmm. so there's yeah. really no harm in giving it. Yeah. It's just finding a clinic. I mean, like you're, you're working in a, in a, in a vet clinic too, or where, where that's what you do, right? Like you just, you play with each individual animal and, and their drugs and their drugs and their remedies and their food. And, and yeah. you make an individual program based on, on them with anything from cancer to arthritis to skin disease to, emotional stuff to everything right sometimes animals have been on drugs for such a long time and now we have not just the prednisones but the apicals and the cytopoints and and all of those that that really we don't know the long-term effects of those drugs because those long-term studies were not done um but but we're dealing with the immune system on a very very deep level with those drugs um they've been on it for a long time you try to take them off and they get so bad that you have to put them back on it again because they can't even sleep they're just ripping their, yeah. their skin apart so and there's been so much suppression that this kit is a really really tough case so you have to find that balance of yeah and, and holistic and how many times have we seen animals that are on drugs mm -hmm. and and that is exactly what happens and you wind up we wind up getting them to such a low dose that we're checking their liver enzymes or we're checking their kidney enzymes. We're doing all the diagnostics and it's not affecting them, right? Because we're supporting the kidneys, we're supporting the liver, we're giving the remedies that they're only having to use minuscule amounts. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I think, I think, you know, there's, there's always that gray zone, right? Nothing is ever black and white. And life isn't black and white and animals and people aren't black and white. It's black and white in every single thing in between. Mm -hmm. So try not to get too stuck on what should be happening and what shouldn't be happening. And whatever you do, I mean, this is a homeopathic, well, not serious, but this, this particular night is on homeopathy. Um, if you've tried homeopathy and it hasn't worked, don't give up on it because I would say 99% of the success rate of homeopathy is your practitioner mm. and their experience mm -hmm. because homeopathy is one of the most difficult things, one of the most difficult um, modalities to practice. It's a hard modality to practice. And yeah. the same thing there's, there is from, really classical constitutional prescribing that can that can create a miracle all the way up to daily combination remedies for lifetime for their mm -hmm. lifetime right and everything in between and like with toby you know mm -hmm. toby got two extra really great years like toby was less at 18 he was less had less dementia or less 
cognitive disorder than he did like when he died and he did when I saw him. Yeah. Yes. Right. Like, like, like they're qual. I have horses here that are on, that have been on homeopathic remedies for, and it's blasphemy to some homeopaths, but I've, I've got, I have horses here that I rescue that get off trailers that are dragging their back legs that we're supposed to go to rendering, mm -hmm. like rendering for dog food and are walking now have incredible, incredible lives. And, you know, six, seven years later, and they're on remedies every single day and lots of them, you know? So it's like, what's your option? quality of life and lots of homeopathic remedies to continue to remind the body to, oh yeah, I got to do that. Oh yeah, I have to pee. Like, that's what my nerves are for. Like, like reminding the body what it needs to do and having a great life or being in a dog food can. Like, <laughs> I've got a really, a really interesting case of a, it's a min pin who is, I think she's probably 13 or 14 now. But this is going on, is it two years or three years? She had a, um, a tumor in her pelvis and her spine was breaking down. So the spine was actually disintegrating at the pelvis. And when she came to see, I was working with Dr. Cheryl Burke and this dog came to see us. And when she came in, she said, I just, I just want something for pain control because they're telling me it, it's only going to be maybe two or three months at the most because she won't be able to pee, she won't be able to poo, she yeah. won't be able to walk, she's being too much pain. And she was on gabapentin and all kinds of pain medications, but, but nothing that would actually treat what's going on. So we started treating this dog and I put her on cancer remedies because it was a cancerous tumor, bone, spine remedies, mobility remedies, uh, to, and pain. So we had a pain combo going on. We had a bone combo going on we had a nerve thing going on because she was paralyzed on one leg at one point she got paralyzed on both her back legs and was dragging herself so this little dog her name is angel and she to this day this is two and a half years pretty sure it was december three years ago this december runs around walks is absolutely blowing everybody away and their gut says Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because she is doing so well. And they took re-x-rayed her and the bone actually started fusing together. So she was getting bone regeneration, which, which shouldn't be happening. So, but she's on a ton of remedies every single day. And I don't want to take her off any of the remedies because I feel like oh, <laughs> that pathology, if we take one thing away, she could crash and we might not get it back. So sometimes it's what you have to do. But well, it's it is. And, and how can you say that's wrong? Yeah. You can't. No. You know, is it, is, it, is it what, you know, Hahnemann would do? Or is it what, like, it, it, at that point, it doesn't matter. And that, at that point, there's empirical proof that it's helping. And that's what we're here. Well, that's what you and I are here for, is to, <laughs> is to create that kind of quality of life right and and not to not to not create it because it doesn't fall within the guidelines of what people think are class is classical homeopathic it isn't classical homeopathy it's not classical homeopathy no but it's still but, homeopathy but i think even Hahnemann, if he was alive today would would have evolved homeopathy from where it was 200 oh years gosh. ago it's a it's a field that's always growing and we're always learning by our own expertise and by our experience what is working and what isn't working and homeopathy is a little bit different with animals than people as well um yeah. like julie taught me um you, sometimes you have to change remedies more often sometimes you have to go higher potencies you have to repeat them more often you have to do them for longer so it's a it's a little bit different than human homeopathy but it's different from classical homeopathy too where you give a remedy and then you observe and wait. Sometimes you don't have time to wait. Sometimes you have to be changing remedies really quickly. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a so it's it's cool going field. It sounds like a success story to me, for yeah. sure. 
pretty cool one. Yeah. We've uh, got lots of those. Lots every of day. Them. Well, you know what? I, I do remember the, I think it was, I don't think it was Portland. I don't remember the vet conference that I lectured at um, when I talked about, about giving remedies every day and giving them a liquid and cussing them. And I showed all of these, I think I showed 11 cases where, where they shouldn't have survived and they're surviving six, seven, eight years later with, with either a combination of remedies. Remember that Andrea it was just like how, how the body, how resilient the body can be yeah. given the right tools. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, Absolutely. it's, it's not a, it's a pretty common practice. It's not, uh, it's not that uncommon to see that with the right prescriptions. Yeah. Aww. Jasper. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Aww. Jasper, what's the band? <laughs> Sweet thing. Hey, Steph. Yeah, I'm going here. Uh, oh, gosh. And Crystal, they have a similar question. It's, um, it's no, you know what? It's not similar. Who am I kidding? Peter's uh, question is asking about a homeopathic pancreas remedy. Um, severe IBD, sensitive to all proteins, multiple fecal transplants. Is there anything you could suggest um, for that dog? Some a homeopathic pancreas remedy. Pancreas, yeah. Arnica, iris, and phosphorus. And sometimes chelidonium. Chelidonium, yeah. Especially if there's liver and gallbladder involvement, which is, is yeah. often connected, those three. Um, yeah, really good liver support. And yeah. iris is, pardon? Sorry, go ahead. Arnica d helps with the pain. Pancreatic stuff can often be painful. Um, iris is a fabulous uh, pancreatic remedy. Unbelievable. Uh, phosphorus, great for liver, pancreas, gallbladder, everything. Chelidonium, yeah, great for gallbladder and liver. Yeah, those would be the ones I would recommend too. And Arnica, like you said, right from the get-go, Arnica, Arnica is life-saving in pancreas issues because the, again, the cortisol levels and stuff are notorious for, um, doing all kinds of wacky things with with the pancreas so the 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 faster you can get them out of and sometimes you don't even think they're in pain you can often often know that they're in pain because their back is arched but and that's the only thing that, that they're actually showing but mm -hmm. yeah remedies for pancreas is a, for the pancreas the incredible remedies yeah. crystal's asking would you give them all at the same time would you give them what? I didn't hear that. All at the same time. Yes. We would. Andre and I would. <laughs> if they're if it's if it's if the animal's really sick. Yeah. Because that's it that's the whole that's the whole issue, right? It's like you could give arnica, wait for a few days, let's see how arnica works, and then you could add phosphorus. It it depends how sick this dog is this dog is really sick and it's had all of this stuff and it's still really sick. I would rather just give it everything for five days, six days, maybe a week. And then you can just take one thing that's not maybe as indicated constitutionally out, right. Or, or start to reduce everything, but maybe iris and then leave them on iris, low potency sometimes for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, yeah, if it's sick, that's, that's the beauty about giving combination remedies is that you can give them, um, your, your whole, your whole process is to create the biggest healing effect, the fastest. Awesome. Okay? Yeah. And just to know for people. So if you're giving remedies, sometimes you have to get for pancreatitis, especially if it's severe, you have to give them for quite a while, like two, three, sometimes even a month. So if anybody's giving remedies for that long of a time, like three times a day or twice a day for a long period of time, always make sure you make a liquid remedy out of it. Yeah. It's a cusp. 
because this is a, probably one of the biggest mistakes that people make, that lay people make, is there's something called a homeopathic proving. So a proving, when you're giving the same dose of the same remedy every single day for mm, two, two and a half weeks after that, you can't keep giving the remedy every single day. So proving is how we know what remedies have what symptoms associated with them. A healthy individual takes a dose of a remedy, usually at least 30 C or higher potency. There's more risk of provings with higher potencies. There's more risk of aggravations with higher potencies. So healthy person takes the remedy every single day for a month, and then they report back on all the symptoms. And then we have you know, a control group of people that are doing this, and then we come up with all the symptoms for that remedy. So any remedy given twice daily for longer than, or daily for longer than two weeks, make sure it's liquid and you're suppressing, banging on the palm of your hand five times before each dose. That way you change the potency just a tiny bit each time and you avoid a pain. Awesome, yeah. good to know. If the animal's sensitive, I, I like, I usually start right from the get-go. Because if it's really sick, chances are they're going to be on it for a long, for a while. Yeah. Right. So starting off with 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 it made it into a liquid is always, in my opinion, a good idea. Because mm -hmm. why you know why to even take the chance? Yeah, and it's easier too instead of having to do pellets all the time. You just do the liquid. It's easy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a good question in the chat. Is there a book that you could recommend for the attendees at home? Something to to look at when we're looking to help our animals and we can't sit with you ladies here doing something like this? You know, well, there are so many self-help homeopathic books out there. There's one, Julie, it's the one that you really like too. It's Desktop Companion. Um, uh, Morrison? It's, Mor for, it's for homeopaths, but I think that, that I think it's really good even for, for yeah. pet parents and, it's, and lay it's, people. And it's a little more advanced, but the book is really good at, um, breaking down what the disease is and then the top remedies for that disease. And it's sort of gives you a snapshot of each remedy and then you can kind of pick and choose your remedies. Um, Roger Morrison, Desktop Companion to Physical Pathology. Got it sitting over there. Awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really, really good one. And for people that are just starting out and want to know a little bit more about animals, um, Don, I love Don Hamilton's book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, I love Don Hamilton. He's an incredible animal homeopath but don don hamilton has a book called um homeopathy for small animals i think i think that's what it's called but the, his he's a vet his name is don hamilton that one and the one andrea is is saying that's a little more high level um uh those two together are really good like the thing the thing with the desktop am i getting all weird Am I good? No, nope, you're good. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, the thing about the desktop, it doesn't really give you, um, it's not like a beginner's guide. No. So if you get on Hamilton's, you can read the intro about, you know, watching and what to, what to see and all that. And then the desktop guide has a lot more, well, it's clinical pathology. It's, it's literally listed in, like you just look it up, it's for people but you look up, you know, arthritis, or you look up torn ligaments, or you look up, like it's, it's, it's listed with the pathology. So it's, it's an excellent one. Yeah, John's, yeah, I love John's book too. That's one of the first books I ever had. Super helpful, thank you. Lori's got a question. Um, she's looking for something to help a cat with neurological symptoms that could be related to over vaccination. So she recently rescued a purebred Maine Coon. She talked to the previous owner and the breeder and she started asking lots of questions. Good for you, Lori. And she found out that the cat reacted badly to all her kitten vaccines, but the allopathic mm -hmm. vet kept giving them and the breeder thought she was doing a good thing. The cat 
Um, now Lori believes has neurological problems. Potentially, she feels potentially vaccinosis. Um, neurological problems like what, like weakness, or does it have tremors? What's what's it doing? She shakes. It is not very stable on her feet. Mm. So a good anti-vaccinosis first, um, the anti-vaccinosis remedy, silica and thuya. Try to get rid of the toxicity. Yeah. And then probably remedies to deal with the neurological aspect of things. Um, hypericum might be a possibility, Ruta. Um, then conium. Shake conium, yeah. Shaky on her feet and weak. Gelsenium. Gelsenium. Gelsenium is a good anti-vaccinosin and has all that neurological yeah. disorder. Perfect. But there is. I mean, I know on something like that would be it would be helpful for Andrea to take that case or a homeopath to take that case because the the the, the more finite something like that that's long term and I don't know how old this cat is, but you know, you don't want that progressing almost like an MS or something, right? Like the, you want to try and get on top of it. And sometimes it's a lot easier and more productive to really know what you're doing in a case like that. Right. And the, like, mental, picture, the mental picture is also important too. So yeah. you want a remedy that kind of fits, even though it's, it's a, a clear physical symptom and it's, you know, highly likely it was vaccine induced, you still want a remedy that fits the whole picture as best as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, she said she tried anti-vaccinosis, but, but nothing took. It looks to me like it is neurological. Mm -hmm. but I have to do it for longer as well. Mm -hmm. but yeah. But, and, and the thing with anti-vax is that what it does is it, like, that's what I'm saying. Like if it's, if it's, if it's a long stemmed situation from a vaccine that has been layered and layered and layered with vaccinations, sometimes you have to repeat the anti-vax a few times, but then what that, sometimes there actually is still a clearing, right? So you, you wanna make sure that the vaccine is, the side effects of the vaccine that are still lingering are gone and then you can go in with a more specific remedy, like Andrea was said, like gelsinium or conium or causticum or phosphorus, or, you know, really, it would really depend. Um, but the, the, the silica and the thuya sort of paves the way for more of a constitutional remedy to come in then and help sort it out. Because almost all the time you have to go back, if you, if you start in with just a constitutional, they often don't do anything either until you go back, do an anti-vaccinosis, and then go in with the constitutional remedy. And then it's like, then you start seeing major shifts. Mm -hmm. There's layers to it. Oh, massive. Yeah. It's an onion. Definitely, yeah. By the sounds of it, it's, it, it can be very complicated. Yeah, it can. Stephanie's got a question, Andrea. Can you give an overview on dosing homeopathic remedies, i.e. how often to give, how long to wait, and, and when to look for improvement? Could you talk about that a little bit? We pro I probably should have started there. <laughs> sure. We have an hour still. Um, it depends on the circumstances. So if we're treating something acute, you can repeat remedies even every two or four hours for several doses. If after like four or five, maybe six doses, you don't see a change. And again, it really depends on what the situation is and how severe things are. Um, if after four or five or six doses, you don't see a change, then you know you can wait a couple hours or maybe not even a couple hours and change to a different remedy. If you're treating, and then if the remedy's working, you can start spacing it out more, go to every four to six hours or even every, every eight hours and then do it again when symptoms are getting better space it out more even to every eight hours for maybe a day or even two days yeah and then you can go to twice daily until things resolve 
but every situation is different and it depends on what's going on. If you're treating chronic stuff, then you might give a higher potency of a few doses of the remedy and potentially do, you know, repeat it once a week for a while. Yeah. Um, reassess after a month if things are getting better. You might do, um, you know, like a, a combination remedy. Again, this should be a homeopath who's, who's dealing with this. Somebody has some animal knowledge, um, either a homeopathic vet or a homeopath that works with a vet. Um, you might do a remedy twice a day for seven days, that's how things are. Then you might do it longer. So it, it really depends on what's going on. Yeah. And the, and the really tricky thing with animals, and the reason that Andrea and I practice like this, is because I've seen the right, the correct remedy given. And like classical, class, don't get me wrong, I love classical prescribing and I've seen miracles with classical prescribing. But what I've seen more, more, what I've seen more than, than anything is even the correct remedy given but stop too quickly. So let's just use our Senecum as an example. So a dog has, you know, diarrhea and it's stinky and it's having to go out all the time. And, you know, the, the, the classical thing is give a dose and watch and wait and see, right. Or give, um, and it's like, okay, I gave a dose and oh, wow. Yeah. It, it, it helped a little bit, but then it came back and then, okay, well it came back you know, so let's, let's give it again. And then they give it again and they watch and they wait and they see and then it comes back again. And it's like, okay, what this animal really needs is it needs that like every, every time it's getting a cramp. Like, like if you were taking a remedy, a person was taking a remedy for diarrhea like that. And we took a remedy, we'd be able to go, oh my gosh, okay. I feel, I feel better now. And then maybe 45 minutes later, you'd start getting cramps again because it helped initially, you would take another dose. And then usually that dose lasts maybe, you know, an hour or two hours. And then, oh my gosh, I'm getting the cramps again. You take another dose. So you can take the dose as we're feeling how we're feeling. So what happens with animals is we don't know how they're feeling until they're like outside with explosive diarrhea again. And then by then, you're not sort of cutting it off at the, you're not derailing the disease and you're not derailing the problem. And we've, we've given remedies that, that other people or other homeopathic vets have given. That's the correct remedy. They're just not giving it in the right duration. So they're, they're on the right track. They just don't have the experience or the knowledge or the training to know, okay, yeah, in this acute situation, I might, I, I think I probably should be giving it every hour three times and then, then watch and wait and then maybe give it every four to six hours. They're, they're giving one dose and watching and waiting and then it's, it's then it just doesn't work. Right. So, but you're on the right track with the right remedy. So if it's acute, we're on, Andrea and I are on the same principle that you give it, you give it pretty close together and with after the third dose you should see major shift right like so like sometimes you can give it every hour for three doses and and then by then by by those three hours you should see a major shift so it's a it's it's um yeah it's a it's an interest that's why it's so hard to practice that's why not very many people practice animal homeopathy because yeah. it's it's a, it's a, it's, it's complicated. It's a, it's, it's an incredible to me. It's like the best modality of medicine out there. Um, but it's very individualized and it's very, it with animals, you know, there's, there's pretty clear protocols that we've always used for 15 years that work. We know, we know by going, you know, give a dose every hours for three doses, watch and wait. If it's doing better, spread the dose out a little bit to like, and then every four hours or then every six hours, like we know that that's, that works, you know, after, after one dose, if they're wor worse, it's not the right remedy. Mm -hmm. then yeah. You, worse, right I mean, you definitely, yeah. 
will continue. Right. If the animal gets worse at all, it's not a detox in an acute situation. So no. no. So don't think that, oh, he's getting worse because he's detoxifying. No, he's not. He's getting worse. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're giving a remedy and your animals are getting worse, you're not giving the, for cutes, you're not giving the right remedy. You need to change remedies right away. Interesting. It's, it's the difficult, I know we're getting on time here, right? Um, it's the challenge of homeopathy with animals. Your patient can't tell you, can't talk to you. Yeah. Well, it's all by observation. It's all by, you know, intuitively sort of feeling, you know, how what makes them better, what makes them worse. Um, uh, are they getting better or are they getting worse? Is it an aggravation? Do you need to change remedies? They can't talk to you. So constitutional prescribing is also a lot more difficult with animals that way too, because you don't get all those fine details that you get from a person that can tell you how they feel. Um, yeah, so sometimes it's a, it's a best guess at the remedy based on the information you have. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a while to find that true constitutional remedy. Well, it's a keen sense of awareness too, right? It's like, it's like seeing lots and lots and lots of cases and also knowing how to get the right information and, and, and really, really letting people know that have the animals, all the finite stuff to watch for, right? Mm -hmm. any changes oh no there's nothing nothing different are you sure are they getting on the couch more they get oh well, yeah well now he's literally sleeping in like it's like that's a pretty big change <laughs> you know like just really paying attention to to all the changes yeah very important great thank you so much there's a ton of questions here left um we could probably sit here for another we could sit here all night but as always, if anyone has questions for us, please give us a shout, questions at adoredbeast.com, and we'll give you a hand however we can. We can, take a, we can take a couple more. Yeah, Andrea, you don't have a, a hard stop here? No. I had a really interesting one there that I wanted to ask. Is it true that homeopathy can cause no harm if it is not needed, or can it create issues that may not have existed prior? Hmm. If it's not needed. So if you give a remedy and, well, first of all, if it's not needed, why are you giving a remedy? But it, it won't, a remedy won't necessarily cause harm if, if it wasn't indicated. It just won't do it. It just won't work. Um, it'll cause harm if you give it for a long time and then they end up having a proving. I see that a lot with people that are, are buying remedies and sometimes some really high potency remedies yeah. online or whatever. And then they've just been giving it for months and months and months and the animal's having all these issues. Um, that can cause harm. You can, you can cause harm if you give a really high potency of a remedy. High potency remedies should be fairly well chosen because there's a higher risk of aggravation. So we always say, you know, they don't really have any side effects, but you can have homeopathic aggravations and that is something that you have to be mindful of. So, you know, I, I feel home, homeopathy should be, should be prescribed by a homeopath um, unless you're using quite low potency remedies, then there, there's not as much risk with those. So can it cause harm? It, it not in the long term. Any harm created by homeopathy or aggravation usually clears up and stop it. Yeah, it's not, it's not like you're going to give a remedy and it's going to cause your animal to go into kidney failure or right. liver yeah. failure. But I think, I think um, like Andrea said, like why would you, if, if it's not indicated, then what, like why would you be, if you're, you, would, you don't want to give remedies if your animals are healthy. Like there's no sense in there's no sense in in giving a remedy if your animals are healthy. But I think that that of all the modalities of of prescribing, I think homeopathy is the most gentle. And the and and exactly like Andrea said, where you run into problems is if you give it if you give dry dose remedies, high potencies, 
and for too long a time, then you can that you can get an aggravation or approving. So it's paying attention. Like, did and the way to look for provings is is does your animal have some, is your animal getting some a symptom that it didn't have before you gave the remedy? Right, that's approving. So approve approving is like if your if your if your animal's limping and you give a remedy for limping and then all of a sudden it has green diarrhea and it's never had green diarrhea in its life <laughs> because you're giving the remedy too long and the remedy has green diarrhea, it treats green diarrhea, then chances are you've caused your animal to have green diarrhea from giving the remedy too high, too high of a potency, too long. Um, aggravation is an aggravation of the symptoms that they already have right so if you say limping again you give a remedy and the dog starts to limp more and you stop the remedy sometimes an aggravation can be a good thing because it means that the body's the body is um uh been been triggered to look at that to look at that symptom and then if the if the if the pain goes away and then it becomes better. That's a true homeopathic aggravation followed by an amelioration, right? So it's followed by the animal getting a lot better. So it kind of like tells the body it needs to do it. It kind of gets worse and then it gets a lot better. So that, that's a true homeopathic aggravation. Mm. But if it gets worse and it stays worse, that's not, it's not the right remedy. But in general, we've, what, in 20 years, more than 20 years of practicing, how many times have we ever seen a true, a true proving or a true, what, something bad happen? Like, you know, mm -hmm. unless someone hasn't followed the instructions or something, right? Yeah, homeopathy is generally safe and also the beauty of homeopathy is that you can give it in conjunction with medication and not work. contraindicated with anything, whereas supplements and herbs and everything you have to be a little bit careful depending on the medications they're on. Sometimes they can interact. So yeah. it's a wonderful thing about homeopathy. You can give it alongside anything. It doesn't, doesn't affect anything. Else. Yeah. That's fantastic. Very helpful. Should I ask one more quick one? Um, sure. I'm, I'm kind of curious too. <laughs> her her 10 year old chocolate lab finally making the switch to raw he does have ibd is there anything homeopathic that i could give to him while we switch him over to raw sorry how old is he he's 10 10, 10. year old yeah ibd he he's switching to raw not having any issues yet she said, I'm finally switching Bear, my 10-year-old chocolate lab, to raw. He has irritable bowel disease. Is there anything homeopathic that I should give him when I switch over? Hmm. Well, do a very, do a gradual transition. That's what I was going right? to Depending, yeah. Any animal with an existing issue, especially if it's a GI issue, you want to do a slow, and he's been on whatever food he's been on his whole life. You want to do a gradual. So coming off kibble, going to something, um, like a canned food or even home cooked first that you can transition over a few days away from the kibble and then you can start mixing a little bit of raw into it and over the course of probably a week or even longer gradually transition to raw and and pick a raw to begin with that isn't really heavy in like bone because it might be a little tricky for him to digest ground like pieces of bone um do uh, a raw that has a bone meal or really like really finely ground bone and anything you should give him if he has a problem you can add some uh pumpkin or cooked squash with the food the fiber can help with the stool issue you know the the gut soup supplement is amazing for that and if he has a problem with a, an ibp flare-up then back off but you know, the, the remedy that I kind of is my go-to remedy for um, aggravation, diarrhea stuff from food is arsenicum. And I would probably do a 30C, a few doses, if he gets diarrhea from the food change. Yeah. 
So I, I would agree. Like with, even though Andrea and I are like raw food advocates for 20 years, I was just, I used to be, everyone used to think I was the most anal person in the world when I would switch animals over, especially old animals that had issues. Um, and the reason was because I was such a raw food advocate that I didn't want anything to go wrong, right? I didn't, I didn't want, you know, someone racing to their other vet clinic or something saying, oh yeah, you know, my dog has explosive diarrhea now because I, I put him on raw food. I always recommend cooking the food first, especially with a 10 year old IBD dog. I would be doing a mm. home cooked diet and then mixing either cooking it less and less or mixing the raw food after four or five days, mixing the raw food little by little, like, like literally, you know, a quarter or an eighth of a cup each time and slowly working him into it. And, um, and Andrea's right. Like the thing that probably would help the most is giving him gut soothe even prior to switching, giving him gut soothe while you're, while you're, um, while you're even on, on starting on the cooked food and keeping them on it. If he's got IBD, keeping them on it for at least three months, keeping them on the, on, on gut soothe. Cause if he's got IBD, he's got something wrong with his, definitely something wrong with his microbiome. Yeah. So that the, the, the gut system needs to be healed in that dog. Sometimes raw food can be, you can do it just with raw food, but he's probably going to need more than more than just a raw diet. And I've all, I've also seen dogs with IBD not be able to go on to raw food until they are, are treated. Oh. <laughs> Who's that? Theo. <laughs> um, so yeah, just be, just be a really, be really con. This is where I'm talking about. Don't, you know, don't cut your nose off to spite your face. Raw food can be life-saving, especially with IBD. But sometimes you need more than raw food to, to support them, to get them in the place that then the raw food is going gonna, is gonna to really, really do its magic. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your time with us this evening. Tamara says thank you. Susan says thank you. Uh, Eva says thank you, Andrea. Jackie and I are so grateful. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank awesome. You. That was an amazing session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Because I haven't seen Andrea like this for a long time, so I might just I know. for a while longer. <laughs> you hang out for a while still. <laughs> yeah, you, you ladies want to hang out? It's all right. Behind the scenes. We'll put it on the podcast. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate it. Okay. We'll see you next oh, Wednesday. Yeah. You put, did you put Andrea's um, thing in the chat? Yes, I did. AndreaRing.ca. Okay, I saw someone ask if she was. They were taking. She was taking patients, and I don't know whether you are. You have a waiting list, but well, anyways, I'm, they can contact me, and we can figure something out. Figure it out. Okay. Thank hey, you so I much, everyone. This went by so fast. Yeah. I know. Thank, Thank you. you we'll have you on again. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Andrea. Bye, Julie. Bye.